Yes, love it. What's up, everybody? How's it going? Uh, it's been a hot minute. Uh, I was at a conference last week, so I couldn't do any kind of Instagram live stuff. But we're back. We're back with a very special thing today. Um, we're going to be talking about med schools, how to choose them, kind of the next step after the MCAT, which we don't really think about because the MCAT is just a gi it's this gigantic hurdle that we've been so focused on for like a six month, seven month, eight month period trying to pass it. And then all of a sudden we're done with the MCAT and we're like, okay, what's next? Um, so that's what today is all about. Um, so let me uh, really quickly just invite a couple people to hop on because I'm going to be joined not just by uh, Winston or my dogs today. We're hanging out with Blueprint MCAT. Um, so heck yes, we've got Blueprint Med. Get in here, hang out with us. This is wonderful. Camden, yes. All right. Uh, uh, how's it going? Oh, how are you? I'm doing so well. Oh, hello, friends. Oh, it's nice to see you. Heck yes. Uh, welcome to, I guess, our first joint, um, like, Blueprint MCAT, Blueprint Med uh, venture together, right? So thanks, y'all, for joining us. Yeah, I'm Definitely. so excited. Love it. Um, all right, so, hey, I could literally sit here and wax poetic and do some intros for y'all for, like, five, ten minutes, but honestly, none, none of it's going to do you justice. Um, so, like, a couple minutes, real fast, just why don't you introduce yourselves to everyone that's hanging out with us. Um, and kind of like, why, why are we all hanging out together right now? <laughs> yeah, do you want to go first or me to go first? Oh, uh, yeah, I'll go ahead and start us off. Um, so, okay. hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Camden McDowell. I'm a uh, MD, PhD student up at Rutgers Robert Wood Johnson Med School, and I got my PhD from uh, Princeton University in neuroscience. Right now, I'm an M3, so I'm kind of, you know, almost finishing up med school, uh, and I've been part of the admissions committee here at Robert Wood Johnson for a few years. And so, you know, while it's been a few years since I applied to med school, I remember near and dear in my heart just how kind of hard that process is once you get to the point where you're trying to figure out where to apply, and like what's, what features to look for. And so it should be a really fun conversation. Um, you know, some of our anecdotal advice to help point you guys in, you know, what hopefully is, a, you know, the right direction. Karen, uh, yeah, thank you so much for joining us. I'm super excited just to like chat with you for a little bit, but I love how you said it's near, like the application is near and dear to your heart when like, <laughs> you're always half expecting you to say, I still have PTSD and Stockholm syndrome from it. So, you know, yeah. A little, you know. Bit, of that too. A little bit of that too. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Awesome. Okay. Um, love it. So thank you so much. And then um, we're also joined by Kennedy. Hi, would you like to oh, introduce you. yourself as well? Yeah, absolutely. So my name is Kennedy Dawson. I am a second year osteopathic medical student at Kansas City University um, in good old Missouri. So I am, um, I got my master's in public health before medical school. I am just, I'm studying right now to take my board exams. Um, hello. I see people I know in the live. Hi guys. I'm studying to take my boards. So, and I am a blueprint med school campus ambassador. So that is why I'm here today. And I love, I share stuff on my own personal page about life in med school, you know, the ins and outs, what you need to know, all kinds of stuff like that. So I love talking to pre-meds and I love like trying to mentor people on this journey. And I also, I do have some PTSD from the pre-med process a little bit. So, but I don't know if it's outshadowed by the current like uh, stress that I'm feeling for boards right now. We'll see, we'll see how it ends up. Yeah, yeah, which one ends up tipping the scales, mm -hmm. right? Um, well, Kennedy, that's amazing. Thank you again so much for uh, hanging out with us. Um, and yeah, just for uh, just hanging out with us at Blueprint in general. Um, I really, uh, it, just two seconds ago, what you were talking about as far as like, just, you know, you're kind of connecting with people and you're going through this whole process. Um, I'm so glad y'all are here because like, it's such an isolating process in general, especially if you don't have people who have like, A, been through it before or like anyone in your life who's just not, like you are the sole pre-med, like even a science major. So thank you guys so much for joining us. Um, Let's just dive right into it. I'm literally, I think I'm going to hit y'all with like the hardest hitting question right in the beginning. Um, terrible interview skills. You're supposed to save the juicy stuff for the end, but whatever. Um, I'm willing to bet that almost the entire majority, well, it's the majority of people that are here uh, want to know how much does your GPA to an extent, and then most importantly for us, hey, what up, we're Blueprint MCAT. How much does your MCAT score actually matter? when it comes to your application and everything? Is it all encompassing? Because I've heard everything from like, it's weighted equally all across versus, oh no, MCAT is like 80%, GPA is 10%, and then like 0. .000 something is everything else. Like your personal statement's fluff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So mm -hmm. um, I'm gonna kick it off to Camden first, because um, correct me if I'm wrong, you're on a, a committee, right? 
Yeah. Um, not this year, but the previous years, I was a part of the admissions committee for our, our MD PhD program. But you're also reading everyone who's applying to the MD, you know, only program. And so uh, that's it. You did start off with a uh, the, the loaded initial question. So um, I think let's just start off with the GPA and let's start about like what you know we're looking for when you read these applications. It's it's like look, there is a there is a minimum to some degree. You know, you want to at least get to a, you know, a solid threshold, whatever that may be. It depends on the tier of school you're looking at and kind of your overall competitive nature of your application. But you need to have at least some sort of like baseline. You know, you can't have a 2.0. It needs to be a little bit higher than that typically, unless there's some really interesting circumstances outside of it. But more importantly, particularly the GPA, in my, in my opinion, is I kind of look for a story in the GPA. Like a GPA can tell you a lot as, it, as you progress through college. And Frankly, I think it can actually be beneficial sometimes to not have a perfect GPA. Instead, show that, like, hey, look, I did kind of struggle, you know, freshman year, and it took me a little bit to, you know, I'm a first-generation college student, or I wasn't sure what I wanted to go into, and then you sort of see that trajectory over time. But it is important to then see that trajectory over time. So even if you started maybe from not the strongest position, but you're on that kind of increasing, increasing score, and you complement it with a solid MCAT, it um it can go a, a long way, and I think that's actually a little bit more compelling than just like I was a perfect student from the very beginning, and I've always been perfect. Yeah, it's like eh, that's boring. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, lately I've noticed that like uh, age of matriculation tends to be trending upwards, and like there's even amongst like students themselves, but like gap year used to be like a four letter word, yeah. and now like students are like, oh yeah, like I'm super looking forward to my gap year, and it's like all right, cool, like. I've been tutoring for a while, like times are changing type of a thing. So um, don't look at my gray hairs. So uh, yeah, thanks so much for like MCAT. Um, somebody threw in the chat, what is like a, a baseline GPA to be competitive for top med schools? I'll throw out there that, um, I mean, like I doubt y'all have like, oh, here are the top 10 GPAs memorized, right? No. Um, so here's, here's something that you can use for yourself. The AMC publishes all this information for uh, uh, GPA and MCAT score for everyone who gets in um, and everyone who just like applies. So check that out. Um, I mean, obviously the more competitive your school, the higher your numbers need to be. So numbers are super important. I mean, we're, we're you know, we're, we're a tough prep company. Of course we want you to get high numbers and stuff. Um, but you well, mentioned you'll something. That I, never, about, never, like, I never put a, You'll notice I never put a, 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 a deliberately didn't put a split that number out there, and that's because it it is more that you you are more than just a number. For yes. everyone oh out there, God. you're more for than sure. just a number. Yeah. For sure. <laughs> we for say sure. that um, we we say that all the time, and actually, let's talk about like how you're more than it, right? So, um, Kennedy, like yeah. we, Cameron mentioned something about like telling a story, and we're gonna mm -hmm. actually <laughs> one of my loaded questions coming up is all about like telling stories and stuff, but. Mm -hmm. um, what does that mean? Like, what did that mean to you when you were doing your yeah. application? And like, yeah, how did you handle this whole to make a story thing? Oh, yeah. So I had the um, the honor and privilege of applying during COVID. So that was kind of a whole a whole thing. Um, now, I actually did not apply with a very strong MCAT score. My GPA was fine. Like there weren't really weren't a lot of red flags. I did a master's program. It wasn't in like the hard sciences. It was in public health. So it didn't necessarily like help me with like a GP, like even boost my GPA further, but my GPA was fine. My MCAT was like, eh, you know, not so great. Not so great of an MCAT score. But what I think set me apart was some of the activities and jobs and experiences that I had and then my interview. And so I think it's like, I mean, I think kind of like Camden say, it's a balance. Like, are your GPA and MCAT important? Yes. Are they everything? No. Cause I feel like I wouldn't have gotten into medical school at all if they hadn't looked into my personal statement, looked at the things that I had done and talked to me. And they just based my like performance off of my, off of an MCAT score. Like they wouldn't have probably accepted me just based off of that alone. So I do feel like mm -hmm. there's like, there's like a balance there for what it is you're looking for. And telling that story, I feel like it's a lot of it is your personal statement. If you can craft like this amazing personal statement that not only shows the things that you've done and what sets you apart as an applicant, but also like it says why you want to be a doctor without just being like, hey, I want to be a doctor, please, please, please accept me. Like you have to kind of be strategic about it. And there's like a really, it's difficult to do. And that's why it takes a lot of like editing and a lot of people helping you and all this stuff. Um, but I think that that is like a huge, huge way. And then just the things you get involved in. One of the things that I did as um, during my gap years, I, did, I took three gap years um, before medical school, which I don't regret. I thought I would regret it. And I actually don't. I thought it was a great time. Um, 
but one of the things you get a little bit that like that life seasoning you know yes yes and I, <laughs> a little a little bit of that income as well usually <laughs> yes. Saved some money like made a salary for a whole like year or two like three years actually and i was like oh my gosh this is me and then i came to med school and now that's all gone but <laughs> Um, it was just a dream. Things, <laughs> it was a dream, pipe dream. One of the things I did, though, as during my gap year and during COVID, is since I had a, I graduated my master's in public health in 2020, so it was very good timing on my end. Um, but I, I like worked for a nonprofit that was providing like COVID relief to the Navajo Nation at the time, and so I had stories on stories on stories and just like experience on experience just from that. And I remember being in my interview specifically, and we all went through, and introduced ourselves, and just said like what we were doing at the time. Every single person in my interview day was a medical assistant, except for me. And I was like, okay, oh, okay. that'd be a bad thing, maybe. But also, I was like, this has to make me stand out at some point. So I think there are ways to, like, set yourself apart, show them who you are, show them your personality, things like that. Mm -hmm. They don't want to see the same applicant over and over and over again. Yeah, yeah we're going we're gonna to end up talking about a couple things. But there, there's a recurring theme that I've noticed pops up over and over again, which is like authentic authenticity, be true to yourself and who you are, like, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they want to know about you, yada, yada, yada. So that, that seems to be a running theme. Um, one thing that I thought was really interesting, actually, is uh, you brought up um, essentially like it, it stories of who you are, like uh, upward trends, overcoming things, yada, yada, yada. Um, how do you how do y'all recommend talking about like red flags or like when you hit rock bottom in junior year right like how do you how do you recommend talking about that should it come up in your personal statement should we just like not even bring it up in interviews like what let, let, let me throw it over to you camden definitely red flags should not define you but they should be incorporated in your application and they should be put in a positive light um you know whether or not let's just use for an example, like a really bad score, you know, tech grade, um, or like a GPA or something like that, or, or a weaker MCAT, um, you know, something like that. You can use that. That's an opportunity not to say, ah, you know, I messed up in my setting. I didn't do well. No. Instead, flip it about like, you know, you persevered because of some challenges. And again, always be true and, you know, what actually happened and always be um, genuine in your application when you're talking about these events. But you can also talk a lot about red flags in a very positive light about what you learned, how it's going to improve and make you a better doctor, you know, how, and, and that's how I talk about them. I maybe wouldn't hit them super hard in the like personal statement per se, unless it really was a very defining moment, but there's usually opportunities in some of the smaller sections of the application that allow you to directly, or, or in like supplemental apps that allows you to directly talk about some of those challenges so i wouldn't be like hey look i messed up like i i wouldn't really like do that but instead say when it when the opportunity presents itself have you know have the story about what it meant to you for that to happen and how you are not going to let something like that happen in the future or how you improved yourself that actually shows a lot of maturity and a lot of resiliency and those two things are going to you know come up time and time again on the committee, like admissions committee board, when they meet in that room, those are two terms that when I hear them, that means that this committee member likes this, likes this student. If you hear resilient and, and mature, they're like, yeah, yeah, we should take this student. Just all those, uh, uh, there's a lot of car students in the chat right now that are giving like tings of like, oh, author tone, layout, yeah, they're resilient, that's positive, they like you. Um, <laughs> sorry for everyone that's like immediately having flashbacks of cars. Um, what can I say? I'm a tutor. I can't help myself. Um, so this, this is this has been great. We are far from done. Um, I think I'm going to toss another question over to uh, Camden, just a little bit more about kind of the big picture stuff. Like a lot of this is application, um, mm -hmm. and, and kind of just the next step after your MCAT. Right, first you do this, and then you realize, oh shoot, I still have to do a whole bunch of other stuff. Here's the applications. Next, like the next chunk, um, I want you all to kind of get warmed up for it. Is specifically choosing the schools. Right before we get there. Uh, Kennedy, mm -hmm. did you do follow-up stuff, right? Like, I don't want to ask Camden because, like, he was part of it in, and, like, I don't know. Uh, actually, you know what? I'm going to ask both of you, but we'll start with you. Uh, did, uh, yeah, did you do follow-up stuff? So, like, send thank you letters, recall mm -hmm. them, like, anything like that? Because one oh, yeah. thing I've noticed is my students feel like it's, like, off limits. They're, like, on another planet. Like, yeah. the admissions board mm -hmm. is this mysterious entity when it's just, like, mm -hmm. people, right? Oh, yeah. No, I did a lot of follow up. So this is this is perfect. Actually, I don't know how you like, 
you're asking me the perfect questions right now. But so the school that I go to now, Kansas City University, I was actually waitlisted. Um, this was my top choice school. This is like where I really wanted to go. And I was dying that I was on the wait list. And so not only, so after my um, interview, I sent thank you letters, like immediately, literally that night I typed out thank you letters. I wrote down during my interview day, specific things that we had talked about. I think I had an interviewer where we talked about her son. We talked about our dogs. Like we talked about like fun things in our lives. I wrote those things down. I said, thanks so much. Like I really enjoyed talking with you about your son. Like that was really helpful for me to learn more about the school. You know, things that made it very personal, not just like I typed the same letter and just click send, send, send. So I did that that evening. I waited for the normal, like the amount of time they told us to wait. And then I got, when I got waitlisted, I immediately had two more people send in letters of rec on my behalf um, to the school. Um, I emailed the admissions committee, asked if that was okay. And I said, I have people who are willing to vouch for me. Can I submit those in addition to my application? They were like, go for it. So I did. And then Oops. one of those was another physician letter. And then I also wrote a letter of intent. Um, I wrote an update letter. Um, right, I wrote a letter of intent just talking about how important it was to go to a school that was close to home and that like my support system, things that were because I, I was a local like applicant. So that was kind of where I was like really hitting hard and the things that I liked about school. Then I finished out um, after it had been like maybe like a couple of weeks and I hadn't heard anything back off the wait list. Um, I sent an update letter um, with like some updates about like um, job things that I had done or just like, I don't really remember exactly what I said in the update letter, but I, I was talking to them constantly. And then as soon as that wait list opened up, I got off of it. So I think- wow. Hopefully it, it worked. I mean, I'll never truly know, but it felt like it was really effective. And like they, we were in constant communication, even though I was on the wait list. Honestly, it, it, at the very least, it, it makes you feel better to be active and doing something as opposed to just yes. like sitting like, okay, like hopefully, you know, um, awesome. Okay. Uh, well, let's throw it over you, Cameron. And like, what do you, th same story, different story? Have you, have you been the recipient of said letters being on that side? Like, yeah, give us your two cents. Yeah, definitely. First of all, that, that's, that's an awesome amount of like grit and determination. <laughs> I mean, like no wonder they took you on that wait <laughs> list. Like, like, I like, I boom, boom. Uh, that's, that's awesome. Um, so I'm going to have to say this with a grain of salt because I was, let's say I started med school. It's going to be nine years by the time I graduate. So it's a little bit, it's been a little bit, but um, I say it was about eight years ago that I was applying. And uh, I did send a few letters, not a lot. Um, and they are their emails, uh, not letters. And I only sent them to people that I felt like I had really kind of bonded with or had a good connection with and that I had something to say in the letter beyond, I had a good time meeting with you. Like something that was genuinely like, wow, I really appreciated the insight you gave me into the program by, by X, Y, and Z. I mean, one letter I did send was to the the director um, at the time of my current program, um, actually kind of commending one of the students that showed us around the program because she did such a wonderful job kind of incorporating us all, making us feel like this is a program that wanted us and we wanted them. And and I think, and I don't know if that was well received, I've never asked him, I guess I could, but um. Like that sort of was more like I could actually write a paragraph about that, not just one line like I enjoy talking to you. So I think you can you can send them, but just sending them if you don't have anything to say is not worth it. And I don't think it hurts you, but I don't think it's worth it. Um, I've received a few of them and it hasn't affected my opinion, to be honest. Um, they were all pretty strong students to begin with that I liked already. Um, but I don't think it would really change my opinion one way or the other unless I was really on the fence about something. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, <laughs> a slight breeze would tip you in one direction or another. Um, so heck yeah. Uh, I think, I think more or less. Yeah. If anyone in the chat has any last questions just about like the application process interview and stuff like that, if not, we're going to kind of pivot a little bit. Um, and let's talk about the, well, the, the, the titular, the title of our, our, our episode today, um, how to actually choose these specific schools, right? So I think that this is a really, really good question. Um, one that I, 
inadvertently have been like doing a survey on for about 10 years as long as I've been tutoring um because I always ask my students like hey what is your goal score for the MCAT and then the follow-up is like why is that your goal score and I'm kind of like soft prodding to see like have you looked into schools have you done research because you know some people just be like I want a 535 because I'm gonna break the test and like love the enthusiasm but like specifically where are we going to be going right so I'm curious for y'all, did you do research like way before you were actually taking your MCAT? Did you like go into all of this pre-med hullabaloo knowing exactly where you wanted to go? Or were you kind of, that was a post MCAT, I'm great, I'm done with the test, now I'm going to think about it thing. Um, and uh, yeah, let's throw it over to Kennedy. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think. So I, I think that I honestly studied for the MCAT first with just the, and I don't, I don't really know that I ever had like a specific I mean, I had just like a range of scores that I was really hoping to get to just like in general, but I wasn't, I didn't really create like a school list until after I had taken my MCAT. I had kind of thought around of like, okay, here's the general areas I want to be at. Here's the, like the type of school that I want to go to and like thought about qualities that I want in a medical school, but I hadn't really thought through me personally. I was more focused on like, I was like, I got to get like do well on this MCAT. And it took me a few tries to like get there on the MCAT so especially after that first attempt when I did very poorly I was like okay I need to like fully focus all of my energy on trying to do better on this MCAT so that I can then apply and like and so I kind of did it that way maybe mm-hmm. had I done like crushed it the first time I might have done it the other way but I felt like it was fine most of my research came through during the actual application process and then especially like the secondaries and it just kind of i did more and more research on the schools as i like filtered my list down gotcha um kim kind of a similar story yeah oh actually i would uh i think a similar time a little bit of context so i you know i don't come from a medical family i grew up in alaska there's no med school in alaska like like <laughs> geographically i went i was down at emory in, in georgia and so like that has a med school but i was like i don't i'm not from georgia i don't really have any particular inclination to stay um, I was applying at the same time as my wife was applying to grad school, um, Y'all in totally separate so field. And so we knew we had to overlap that. And so when I was creating the list, there was a tremendous amount of research that went into that list. Um, uh, but I would say that it was all done after I had my score. Um, and kind of after I had most of the meat and potatoes of my application kind of in, in my kind of CV worked out. Um, and kind of solidified because I also didn't really realize I was going to do med school until, you know, a little bit later in college, you know, junior years when it really hit home for me that that's the route I was going. And so I didn't spend that much time looking beforehand until, you know, my wife and I sat down with these, you know, days on end <laughs> searching for all the different facets mm-hmm. about um, different programs nationwide. So that was more the trajectory I took. Okay. Um yeah, I mean, it just goes to show you, like, y'all came from, like, different backgrounds and different, like, scenarios and, like, completely different mm-hmm. stories. So, um, yeah, th- thank y'all for sharing that, at least, because um, I know there's at least one person sitting in the chat or maybe watching this at a later date that's stressed out, like, oh, my gosh, I feel like I'm behind because I should know everything and I should know exactly where. But, like, no, it's okay. Focus on one thing at a time, MCAT and then. Um, so, yeah, yeah. Heck yeah. So when it comes to, so that was the timeline and everything. When, after you're done with your MCAT, you can finally, finally sit down and focus on med school and everything. Um, what was that research? Like for, for both of y'all, um, let's, let's stay with you, Candom, for a second and then we'll hop back. But what were the things that you were most interested in? And like, what, what was your Google search essentially when it came to your, your med school's list? Yeah. Um, so I think it started with realization of, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very, um, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not particularly aggressive when I apply to things. I'm very like, I like to shoot kind of like within, within my realm, you know? So, so what I did first um, is I, I uh, basically summed up myself in a very objective fashion to myself in like, how strong of an applicant do I think I am? Should I shoot for really strongly in like, top tier, top tier, top tier institutions? How, or should I, you know, hit more top, middle, low tier for me? Research was really important, so the quality of the MD PhD, which is its own like own beast, funding things like that, that was a separate thing that I spent a lot of time searching. But in general, when it came to the med school application, um, I my first you know priority was getting in someplace, and then and and being realistic about the number of schools I should apply to in what tiers. And then from there, it was to ask, um, you know, what overlaps with the lifestyle things that I want. You know, I didn't, not doing anywhere near family or anything like that, but, um, you know, was it part of it? 
you know, U.S. that I wanted to go to? Was it, um, uh, you know, affiliated with cool types of research into what I wanted to do? Was it near options for, for my wife? So was it in the metropolitan area, basically? So those were sort of the features that I look for when designing this. But I think after that initial how strong of an applicant I am, I really didn't ever look back at scores or anything after that, like on the kind of quality schools. That was used as my initial um, kind of scatter shot to see what schools I should apply to. And then after that, I really let more personal factors define what I prioritized in each school, which is also I'll way more what. fun. <laughs> Yeah, let me tell you what, um, the, the idea of not thinking about scores anymore, I know a lot of people just like their ears perked up. Um, so, okay, um, how about uh, uh, Kennedy, same question to you. What were the, 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 what was the criteria that you were looking for that like, quote unquote, made a good school for you? Yeah, so my first, my first like big decision that I had to make when applying was if I wanted to go MD or DO, because and DO is something that had been introduced to me as um, an undergrad student. I had really like never heard of it before. And so that was like a lot of research in and of itself before I even got to the med school part because I just wasn't sure. And so I was like, well, I could just like try to just only apply MD. I don't really know anything about DO, but the more I looked into it, which the Google search started with like literally what's the difference like between an MD and a DO. And then like, what's the perk? Like, what are the extra things I'd get to do? And then the more I kind of like dove into it, looked like I looked at like blog posts of the of osteopathic medical students like I went all over the place YouTube everything that I could possibly think of social media and the more I learned about Dio the more I was like yeah this is 100% like what I wanted to do so that was my first kind of like big split I still applied to some MD schools but I was much pickier with my list because I really only applied to places that were in a location I wanted to go close to family like just kind of around I wasn't really like doing a lot of reach MD schools or anything like that because I really wanted to focus on my DO application. So after that, it was just kind of, I focused a lot on like what, how much OMM experience would I get? Cause that was something that I was excited to learn about something I would like to continue on in my practice. So that was important to me. Um, like location a, as well. How close would I be to family? How close would I have like, would I have support system there? Things like that. And then I looked at the curriculum as well. Um, just because one of the most important things was, will I be, will I go to a school that like will be rigorous and will give me a good education, but also support my mental health while I do it. That was like huge for me. And so I wanted to see evidence of that in, in the curriculum and in like the way that like maybe students were talking about it. Like I would, if I thought, had a question about a school, I would just find someone that went to that school and I would just ask them like on social media or something like that. And everyone was always very receptive. It's a really good way to figure out information about schools you're interested in. Just find someone that goes there and be like, hey, can I ask you what your curriculum's like? Boom, you have a great answer there. And so I did a lot of that. What, um, kind of, I'm so sorry, what, yeah. are, what are some of the things that like, you're in that, with the students in that scenario, they're talking to someone, mm -hmm. what are some of the things about curriculum that they should be asking them? Because I've heard of yeah. things called like one pass, two pass, mm -hmm. systems based, like what, what does all this stuff mean to somebody who, who is yet to take their MCAT and they're kind of, this is all in the future? Yeah. So Camden, I don't know what your curriculum is like. My, so my curriculum is a two pass curriculum and it is systems based blocks, which I'll explain all that means. So two pass. This is like, a, we go through you pack all over <laughs> again. What are these words? I know. We're like, start <laughs> over. We'll break it down like step by step. So a systems based curriculum is basically where you do every single system in like its own block and you have exams for that. And then you just move on to the next system. So like GI, then you go to cardio, then you go to renal and so on and so forth. So that's the way that my school does our curriculum, but we do it in two passes, which basically means our first year of medical school is spent learning how everything is supposed to work. So we learn anatomy, physiology, embryology, um, histology, like normal histology, all of that for the first year. Then when we switch to second year, we figure out how everything goes wrong and that's all the path, like and it just it all breaks, everything falls apart. That's all the pathology, pharmacology, and like clinical medicine type things. It's like very, very board heavy the second year. So that's the way my school does it. When I was looking for like curriculum that supported like rigor, but also like good education, but also mental health, I was more so looking at like, when are the exams? Like, do they provide breaks for me or do they make it really, really hard to take a break? Because my school, we have exams only on Fridays, which is a huge, huge help. And I can't believe like it's, I didn't even think about it before I went to med school, but because every Friday I take my exam, I get the whole weekend off every single time. And that is like glorious because it's my golden weekend for med school. So that was something like my school does that on purpose 
to foster breaks for all of us. Um, things okay. like how long the blocks are, things like just there are like small things like that that all really add up when you're actually in it. And it's things that I don't miss. I didn't necessarily think about before I was actually applying. But I don't know if, if Camden, you're like, what your curriculum is like. Definitely. Um, I, I'm so glad you brought up curriculum because that's actually something that everyone out there, if you're looking to this, 100% pay attention to the curriculum and, and look at how they phrase it. I'll kind of get to that um, in, in a second, because that gets a little bit to the, the kind of time, the mental health, kind of that sort of structure of it. There's certain terms that different institutions use that I think are indicative of, of kind of the atmosphere of, of the area. Um, but uh, one thing on curriculum, so I had the same curriculum uh, as you, two pass, yeah. systems based. That has completely now changed um, at my particular institution. And more and more so, I would encourage people to look for institutions that actually don't do that. The, the more the new kind of push particularly since the initial board exam, something called step one, that is now something that's pass fail, it used to be scored. And now what institutions across the U.S. are doing is shifting to a one pass or a one and a half pass system. Um, Duke actually sort of pioneered this um, pretty early on um, about you know, 10 years ago, where you fly through that preclinical work. And you, you do you know, you may still be two paths where you do first, like what happens in a healthy system, what happens in path, um, a kind of a pathological condition. But that entire two years is going to be compressed, compressed down to 12 months or 16 months, which is a lot of information. It's like drinking from a fire hose. Mm -hmm. So that, that can be hard. But at the same time, it allows you to get on the clinic, on the wards, like in the hospital sooner mm -hmm. um, and move on to that part of the medical training, which is by far the most fun part of medical training. And also having a little bit more time for that part, that you, what, what has traditionally been the final two years of med school, having closer to two and a half or three years for that part, allows you um, more time to study during that part, more time to do research, to, you know, to live your life outside of medicine, yeah. to kind of do all of that aspect of it. So mm -hmm. that's something to consider when you're looking for these programs. Um, you don't want to crush through the preclinical years too fast, because that's going to be brutal. But at the same time, the traditional two years preclinical two years clinical is kind of out of vogue at most institutions now. Mm -hmm. um, one, one criteria that popped into my mind where you're talking, thinking about, you know, mental health and life outside of med medicine. I always liked, particularly when you get to the point of interviews and we start talking to people, just ask them, like one of the best, biggest questions is what do you, what do you do when you're not studying? And the responses you will get will be all over the map. Something that stood out to me, I went to one place and they were like, I'm always studying. I was like, well, that one's off. <laughs> like, that's, there's no balance there. <laughs> I'd be run away, um, run away from that. Like, that's, that's not, that's not a, a, you know, healthy. Like, we, we, we need to have this balance. And that's more indicative of also, you know, if one person says that is different than if everyone you talk to says that. And so take it with a grain of salt. But, you know, are people, do people like look in shape? I don't want to say you need to like go to schools with attractive people. That's not what I'm saying is that just means that they have time to go to the gym, to work out, to have life, mm -hmm. you know, outside of meds, meds, medicine. And so, mm -hmm. you know, do people play music? Um, things like that. Yeah. Those are really nice questions, particularly when you get to the interview process or as you're looking at school social media pages, it can be helpful to start to piece that together. Mm -hmm. So actually what you just said reminded me, um, I was just at a conference with one of our other instructors over, over the past week. Mm -hmm. um, and she is, uh, she's an M1 and kind of was sharing a lot of her like insights with me. Um, and one thing that I heard overheard her saying a couple of times with our, um, with just like some of the students that were walking up is that, and, and again, it was like, Hey, at interview tips, you know, what did you say in your personal statement, et cetera. And she said that like, when it when it comes to interviews if you get an interview they already kind of like you mm -hmm. um but what they're looking for is like essentially what your vibe is as a human being and mm -hmm. she said that like the way that she described it was like schools have a particular you know a vibe in of themselves and they pick people that they think will fit in with like the school and the other students and even within that she mentioned that yeah. each class is has like a completely different like personality essentially do you guys do you guys find that that's the same um can it, does your like yeah. does your class have a specific like this is who we are we're we're the plastics we're you know are you yes. guys what yeah totally to we totally do because i feel like we so since we've only we're only really interacting with like the year above or behind us, those first years, we were really only interacting with the second years. And the second years were like the COVID class. So they didn't even see each other in person until second year. And you could really tell. And now the and then we're seeing a totally different personality with the first years now as we are second years. But we've got like, our, yeah, we totally 
have our own personality like there's a vibe of our class a lot of us are like very similar especially now that we have known each other for two years we're just like we're like a very close-knit class I would say which is really really nice and something that like my school is like fostered in a, in a really nice way especially as boards are coming up I'm like really seeing that like come out from everyone because we're all like really like sticking together now because we're all feeling really stressed but yeah that's 100% true like they're looking for people who blend in and will like fit the vibe and aren't gonna I don't know I'm not sure like exactly how to describe it but it's you can kind of tell when you're like talking to people so like I help with some interviews and in my um, for my our admissions committee and do like panels and stuff you can tell who sticks out for a good reason and for a bad reason pretty pretty easily huh yeah yeah that's so interesting it's not something that you think of but um yeah yeah she was definitely um you know just saying that like it, it, when things get tough mm -hmm. her and her classmates were fast friends and she's like yeah. pretty sure it's by design they make sure because they they want you to have like a support network and yeah. make sure that you know y'all can work together because every student that drops out looks bad for their numbers so like they don't want mm -hmm. you to not make it right yeah. so oh, they um, want you to stay once you're in like they want you to be a doctor like i didn't i don't think i realized that before i went to med school but once you're in like they will keep you in gosh dang it you are staying there so don't, <laughs> don't they're not trying to kick you out anymore like you're in yeah no it's 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 yeah it's all about keeping you in once you're there it totally switches compared to undergraduate which is like yeah. whatever thanks for the four years um okay so so it I confirmed yes this is the thing that is actually happening it's not just um a made up fact yeah. from the ether um camden if they do kind of look for like a vibe check essentially how do you suggest like doing the research? Like, is it just on a, a, a school's website? Like, cause this is a big part of picking your school, right? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great question. And it's, it's um, I think always start off with the website. Um, cause you can look at like, this, like kind of, uh, Kennedy was mentioning with the, the structure of the curriculum, for example, like our test on Fridays, that's easy. You can just find that by going online and looking at their academic calendar. Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's, that's not a particularly hard thing to do. Um, I think this has changed from when I applied to med school, but I think you can really get a lot of information from the social media accounts of different schools now. Mm -hmm. How, how yeah. frequent is it? Do the students have social media accounts and what do they show themselves doing? Um, uh, and I think you can also cold kind of cold call uh, students very easily through social media in ways that like, I couldn't really just email people out of the blue. I guess I could, but that would be maybe less received as something like a ping on Twitter or a ping on Instagram. Um, and so I think start off with a website so that you have a background. So you're not coming in blind. And then you can start to interact with the students on social media and just ask them. If you're in the area also, you can always drop by. Particularly, this has shifted, I think, with so many interviews being online. And like as I think about applying to residency, it's even like on the schools that I know where I really want to go, I'm actually planning to, you know, drive by. I'm in the area, you know, drive by and just talk to some of the residents. And so for you guys who are pre-meds, you know, reach out. Don't be annoying, of course, but like reach out and say like, hey, I'm in the area. I would love to just like, you know, meet with the director of the program or, or talk with some of the students or attend a lecture even. Mm -hmm. um, like those sort of things, if you really want to go someplace or you're really undecided, those sort of things within reason can can go a long way to teaching you more about the program and when, what it's like. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm not from a city. I'm not from New York, but I was looking at a lot of New York schools. I, you know, I, my, my opinion of New York was very much informed by my interviews there. And that, that kind of affected my thoughts about moving to a big city and whether or not that kind of compares to, um, uh, you know, a little bit more suburban uh, uh, schools. Mm -hmm. And usually awesome. a lot of admissions committee, admissions like departments will have students that they like, have prepared for you to talk to like yeah. we have student ambassadors we've got people who like this this literally what we volunteer for to talk to students that want to ask questions so you can always email admissions and be like hey is there anyone i can talk to they will connect you with someone as well if you can't find someone on social media a great one is um also alumni of your college see where they go and i said that mm -hmm. i actually get that a lot as a uh, um or undergrads at either rutgers or princeton where you know i'm training who reach out to me because of some relationship, you know, they're in the lab that I worked mm -hmm. at or something like that. Mm -hmm. And so there's, there's enough of a similarity um, and enough of a relationship between me and them that I may not have ever met them, but they can be like, Hey, Camden, I heard your name from this person, or I'm also an alumni of Emory and I'd love to chat. Um, then you have that similarity and it just, you know, it makes the person that you're contacting a little bit more inclined to also reach out and, and tell you about it. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. 
Awesome. Um, and I'm really glad that y'all are talking about this because like uh, for so many students before we really get into it, like, you know, it, we're knee deep in the weeds here. Um, again, like it, it, there's this perception that like the the med school, because it it is on the pedestal, it is the mountaintop, right? It's untouchable. Definitely. Like, you know, mm -hmm. I don't want to call them and bug them. I don't want to send an yeah. email and annoy them. I don't want to do this, this and this. So like just y'all saying things as simple as like, yeah, hit up their social media and like send them a DM mm -hmm. and just like yeah. call them. They have, I never even considered it, but yes, of course they would have like student ambassadors mm -hmm. that if you call, they mm -hmm. will take you on a tour. So like, yeah. yeah, this is really good for so many students that like, you know, it's still like, oh, med mm -hmm. school, as opposed to like, no, no, no we're all just kind of people and, and yeah. they're just, they want to know who you are. So um yeah this is fantastic thanks y'all um we're, i still got a couple questions loaded up for y'all but um i just want to throw a reminder in the chat um we're gonna do some open q a just in like the last like 10 minutes or so so if y'all have questions feel free to throw it in there by the way we'll also answer any questions like live in the moment if you throw in there so like feel free to ask us questions if you have them yeah. um i sat and i brainstormed and thought very hard about what questions to ask you but <laughs> y'all are probably better so throw them in the chat um okay so uh We've talked a lot about like, you know, the applications getting in and everything like that. Let's talk about like some of the things that you should take advantage of right when you get in, like immediately out of it. Um, and actually, I, I don't know if I should have said immediately, um, maybe, but Cameron, I, I want to hop to something you were talking about way in the beginning of this. Um, but we mentioned several times actually like mental health services on campus. And the, the, the tutor, a peer of mine that I was, um, Pooja, what up, you were awesome. Um, we were talking at the conference and um, she said that her school is incredibly, um, to a surprising degree, like accommodating. Like mm -hmm. a student had a lot of really bad things, like completely serendipitously happened to them on day one of their, of M1. So the first day of med school. And she like talked to the, the board and they were like, oh my gosh, yes. Like just take time off, like totally fine. We'll help you out. She ended up taking like a couple months off, came back and like the school assigned her a private tutor for the rest of the year. So like, that's like a med school going above and beyond what like I could ever consider my undergraduate doing for me. So is that common? Like do schools really want to take care of you that much? Like what, what are some of those services you were talking about Camden? Definitely. I, I, maybe I'm being kind of naive here, but I do think it's becoming pretty common. I think it's becoming pretty common. Um, maybe not, and that's, that's really going over, over and beyond. That's, that's fantastic for that institution. But um, uh, I think the services you, you want are some of the, the cell services. And what I mean by that is like, are they, are they pass fail during their preclinical years? There is no reason the preclinical years need to be graded, and the ma vast majority of institutions are not anymore. But that is a key consideration because you're going to have good days and you're going to have bad days. You all have to take the same boards at the end, so there's no need that every single exam needs to be needs to be a grade or there be some class rank during the preclinical years. So that's a big thing, uh, and that goes a long way towards camaraderie between students because that means that those students are going to work together rather than you know try to maybe be less friendly when it comes to collaborative study. Um, <laughs> yeah, that was a very political that's how, that's how, way to say that. That's, that's how I phrase it. Um, med, med, med students do have a, you know, in, back in the day, there there was some notoriety. Um, but uh, the other thing, so, so like, when are the exams, uh, what, what are the actual explicit services? So is there a dedicated student like mental health service? Is there a dedicated, this was a big one, when one of the features that a lot of students mention when they come to um, actually my institutions, they love the emphasis, there's an entire department on cognitive skills that is there to mm -hmm. tutor you, it is there to help you create study plans, it is there to help you figure out how to do better when you're learning and figure out your learning technique. And they use a lot of the same things that we, as you know, as um, med school tutors actually kind of incorporate into how I work with students. And so institutions that have a very overt kind of programs like that, that aren't just listed on the website, but are also brought up by the students when you talk with them on interviews. And something that like every student seems to bring up, those sort of features are really ones to look at when you're talking about how the, how the, how the program is. And, um, you can always also ask explicitly, what happens or do you have an example of a student that really did have some life circumstances that got in the way and what did the school do to, you know, help remedy the, that, that situation? I think yeah. being respectful but also clear and asking it can go a long way towards uncovering, like, do they just give a generic response or do they actually – give you an example like this example of something that they did directly that helped you that helped that student. I think this is like the third or fourth time that like the theme of 
authenticity, being genuine, wanting to know who you are as a human has come up. So like, hey, y'all, repetition is important. Um, <laughs> um, so, so, hey, Kennedy, when you were like, did all of this as far as like, what kind of services did the school actually offer their students and stuff? Did that make a big impact when you were deciding your school? Yes. Oh, 100%. Yeah. Because I think I, until I like, as I was an applicant, which I think most pre-meds probably think this way, I was thinking the, I had the mindset of like, well, these med schools are like mean, scary places. Like once I'm in, I'm just like fending for myself, like trying to like climb up the hill both ways in snow. And like, they don't really care about me. They're just like pumping out residency match slots. And I was like, hope I was, that's what I was afraid of. And when mm -hmm. I went to my, um, my first interview, exactly what Camden said, the students were talking about all the services that they gave us like a whole hour with the students without any admin in the, like in the Zoom room which was amazing because we just like pelted the students with questions after questions for an hour. And that's something that like I do now, it's just awesome. But they told us about all these amazing things and they were so positive and like, they seemed to just be having like a good time. I mean, of course med school is like hard and it's not always fun, but they were like generally very happy people. And that made a huge difference. And I, that's when I learned about like the mental health services. Like my, my school has very similar things to Camden institution. We've got free mental health services. We've got like, um, therapists that are employed by the university that are free for all four years. You just go as much as you want. You can bring your spouse if you want to do couples therapy, if you want to do family therapy, like wow. as long as you're in the room oh. with your family, your kids, your spouse, whoever it is, like a sister, anybody can come with you or you can go by yourself and all of that is free, which is like amazing because I felt like, because I'm married and I was like, oh wow, so they not only care about me, but they care about like my relationship with my husband because I would like that to be like a happy relationship throughout med school and like I can be like really stressful sometimes to like have a significant other um but things like we are like cognitive thing that he was talking about we call that learning enhancement we have a department as well that is there to help you figure out study strategies figure out a board study plan like a lot of us are using them now as we're getting into our board like dedicated time we're talking with them to figure out like how am I doing, check in, ask questions, things like that. We have tutors. Um, and one of the things that I liked that we had that I didn't know, we had we have like second years that tutor first years, which was awesome because it creates a camaraderie among students because the second years are tutoring the first years in LMM, and that, which is what I do. Um, we have second years that tutor first years in anatomy, which is great because they spend a lot of time in lab. And it just creates, it's like, it was showing that not only do they care about you know, your education, making sure that you understand what's going on, but they care about the camaraderie that they're creating. So all these things that came up during the interview, I was like, oh my gosh, I was like, this sounds amazing. And then I was like so much more excited and felt so much more at ease that my experience would be a positive one. And then now having been here and almost finishing my last preclinical exam is um, next week and I'm about to start dedicated, like I can 100% say that it's been so much fun like I've had more fun being a med student than I ever expected to and I like absolutely love it which is I feel like what I needed to hear as a pre-med is like th this can be fun like parts of it not always fun dedicated maybe not we'll see but the rest of it like so much fun I've like enjoyed every second of it I, I'm so glad you said that. I'm just going to take that sound clip and play it to my students. Be like, look, there is a light at the end of yes. the tunnel. This is the darkness before the dawn, but it does get better. <laughs> uh, there was something that, um, Kenny, you just brought up that this is kind of actually tertiary related, but um, you brought up the idea of uh, you know pumping out residency match spots. So just for, I know there's a lot of pre-meds out there. So remember, once you go through med school, you still have to go through residency after afterwards. And that's where you subspecialize in like emergency medicine or me, I'm, I want to go into interventional radiology. That's kind of where you spend the next, after that point, you know, rest of your, your career. And while I know we're talking a lot about some of the sort of the, the soft features of programs, and um, it is important to consider and look at the residency list of the institutions that you're looking at. That is a, actually a key thing that I didn't bring up earlier. Mm -hmm. It's published online for most schools where they say, here's the number of our students that applied to orthopedic surgery. Here's the number that got in in this year. Here's where they're going. And if there's a very, if you are, you know, dead set on doing community rural medicine, well, there are probably going to be schools that more commonly match residents to those positions uh, than other schools. If you really want to do neurosurgery at an academic institution, then you may want to steer your application towards schools that are affiliated with that. Because where you go to med school, can play a pretty important role geographically on where you get into residency. 
And so if you have a long-term goal, if you are one of those people that plan out the whole rest of your life, first of all, you have to have some flexibility, but you may want to start kind of building that story now um, as you think about, you know, what your, your options are in the future. So that's just something else to look at when you're, when you're looking at these different schools. Yeah, yeah totally agree. Yeah. Y'all are, are too good. That was literally going to be the last question is, okay, so you're an, you're an M1 and you're coming in and you're stressed about residency. Is it too soon to worry? But no, it sounds like we should actually be considering a little bit of it. Yeah, I would, I, I would consider residency right off, the, right off the bat and with the exception that it's going to change. Mm -hmm. I came in um, and I didn't even know the field that I want to go into existed because it had only existed for two years, actually, at that point as a dedicated residency program. And I had no clue it existed until now it is five years later in my training when I returned to M3 and I started to really explore different fields. And what I wanted to originally, which was neuro or psych, I'm not actually looking at those fields anymore. And so I looked at them a lot, though. You want to get involved in the, in the, in the clubs. You want to get involved in, in research if you can. Um, early on, because the earlier you start anything, it shows that interest. And when you apply to residency, it's going to show the story, mm -hmm. kind of your journey in med school and yeah. why you're not choosing Durham just because you want to, you know, make a lot of money, but you're choosing it because you were interested from day one mm -hmm. before you even got your scores back. Right. You were the OG of Durham. The OG of Durham. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. I wouldn't say, I would say don't, don't stress, like, don't like come in guns a blazing, be like, I'm going to be a neurosurgeon. And like, the, you're just like, boom, 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 like, relax, <laughs> just, like, figure out, figure out how med school is supposed to work for a hot second before you're like, freaking out over match stats for the year, especially as like an M1. But do keep in mind, like, what do I like? What do I not like? Like, I came in wanting to do sports medicine of some kind not really realizing there's a lot of different ways that I can do sports medicine. Like I had, I could do family, I could do ortho, I could do PM and R, like who knows. And then, and so like, I have already kind of like pivoted some things, even in my preclinical year. And I can promise you that third year could change things as well. That's really when you're going to actually get to try things and experience things. So, you know, keep your interests, like know what you're interested in and be involved because you just want to learn more about the field and shadow if you can. But then just like hold them all very loosely. Don't come in like as a gunner day one because like that's not a good way to make friends is to <laughs> come and be like, well, I'm going to be a neurosurgeon. And then you might you might have like be labeled with something that you might not want <laughs> from day one. Uh, well, yeah, that's very good advice. You come in and you're like, I'm going to take you down. It's like, I'm your yeah. professor. It's like, exactly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so hey, this was this was honestly a ton of fun. Thank you all so much for um, just the the overwhelming wealth of information and like knowledge. Um, this was this was a blast, and hopefully this was the first in many many more things where Blueprint MCAT and Blueprint Med can kind of hang out. Um, because yeah, you know, hopefully y'all can hang out with me, get some tutoring for your MCAT, crush the exam, and then go hang out with these fine individuals and have everything for your med taken care of too. Um, We've got tutoring, we've got we've got Rosh Review, we've got we have so much stuff. We have med school tutors. It's just so much. It's a We're so much. It so is. yeah, from um from from your MCAT to your white coat, we got you back. Um and this was a lot of fun. So we are going to do one final thing, which is um a giveaway. We are doing Yay. a giveaway. Heck yes. So thank you so much for y'all for hanging out with us. Um here's what we are going to do. Uh <laughs> I have already sent <laughs> this is very official y'all i've already <laughs> sent a message to uh somebody on my team and it is a random number between one and 100 everybody who's hanging out with us right now literally just throw a number in chat between one and 100 and i will tell y'all who it is in fact hey are you guys are you are, uh Kevin and kennedy are you guys on slack i'll slack it to you right now Okay. I don't know if I am on. So there's no, there's no, no call of, of uh, not fair play. So go ahead, leave a comment. Pick a number one through ten. And actually, um, depending on it, we might just kind of, hmm, we might. I don't know Instagram very well. Can we? Can we DM these people? Yes, we can. We can look at the video of recording and see who is saying what, and then we can reach out to y'all. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. Everyone's throwing numbers in the chat. This is wonderful. Um, we are going to look over the weekend. Um, eh, no, let's just do it now. You guys want to do it live? Yeah, sure. Live. I'll be okay. Fine. All right. All right. All right. We've got about five more seconds before I'm just going to spill the beans and tell everybody what my number was. 
We've got a wide range here. I see like yeah, we're uh, are we doing Price is Right rules. I'm kidding. <laughs> we might have to actually. <laughs> we might have to. Um, dun, 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 dun. So yeah, the thing that we are giving away, by the way, everyone, um, we are giving away a Roth Review Anatomy Q Bank, which is awesome. We are giving away um, a Blueprint Swag, which is even more awesome. Whatever, screw getting good grades. All right, you have a piece of swag that's labeled with Blueprint. That's what's important. Mm -hmm. Um. All right, so the actual number, five, four, three, two, one. All right, all of our, all of our guesses are in. So the number was 76, and we have, we have an 87, and we have a 67. So I, I believe the 67, because it's closer by one, right? <laughs> so, oh my goodness, 67 wins. Um, S N C I B U. Will you? Uh, and I can't pronounce it. I don't know. Um, boo <laughs> Will you send us a DM? Actually, I'm looking at your. I'm looking at your profile right now. I see you. Um, send us a DM, and we will reach out to you, and we will give you your awesome giveaway prize. Woo! Okay. Um. So heck yeah. Yeah, thank y'all for participating. That was a ton of fun. This was a ton of fun. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, you're still here. Send us a DM. Yes, <laughs> send us a DM, please. And we will respond and we'll give you your prize. Heck yes. Um, Kevin and Kennedy, again, y'all are awesome. Before we let everyone go, elevator pitch, 30 seconds or less. Um, one last thing. Hey, keep this in mind when you're trying to figure out what med school you want to go to. Camden, you go. Kennedy, you go. <laughs> The one thing is, look, rank, prestige, all of that, spirit means something. Don't let that make or break what you choose. Go to the place that feels like, you know, it's going to be your home for at least the next four years. Go to the place that if you really prioritize family, go to the place that's close to the family. Even if it may not have the, the higher prestige, it doesn't, this sounds a little bit bad, but it really doesn't matter that much in the long run. Mm -hmm. Look. Look at physicians and where they, they came from. It's from all over. And prestige changes. Who knows? The school you're at may be a new med school, but in 30 years, it's going to be, you know, the premier med school in the U.S. So, so don't worry about it. Just, just go to a place that you feel like you're a good, you know, fit for the vibe check. And then let prestige and all that kind of be a, a, a factor, but a, a secondary factor. Yeah. Love it. Excellent advice. Uh, Kennedy, word of wisdom from you, please. Came in Almost stole mine, but my, my little elevator <laughs> pitch is going to be, you're going to get a good, good education no matter where you go. You really will. Like, you are going to be a good doctor. You're going to get a good education. So go to the place that's going to take care of you as a person. Because in the end, you are a person first and you are a med student second. And that's what should be the most important. So go to the place that will take care of you. Awesome. Okay. Love it. You guys are amazing. This was so much fun. Thank you so much for hanging out. Um, yeah. Anybody who just joined us right at the end, we are going to post the recording so you can watch it in the next 24 hours uh, for more. Like we will post it in tw the next 24 hours and you can watch it whenever you want. There was so much good information. These two people were incredible. Um, and yeah, I hope that we get to do another, another one of these soon, y'all. Thanks so much. Have a good one. Thank you.